Uh, welcome back. We're going to continue our discussion with uh, Ai Jin Poo. In our first segment with her, we talked about the amazing victory she accomplished in the state of New York. And we didn't get there. She's accomplished similar victories in uh, four or five other states, I believe, at this point, passing the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights. And uh, I want you to stick around after the show because I'm going to do a whiteboard on this. We're going to really drill down and get you to understand the odds, the, the difficult odds she was facing and, and really the amazing victory that she accomplished. But as I said uh, when I introduced her in the first segment, she's a pioneer. She, she's never going to rest. Uh, she has worlds to conquer, and she's starting to conquer new worlds right now. She's just written a book, uh, The Age of Dignity, that we're going to talk about in this next segment. And she is now working on a new project called Caring Across Generations. So we're going to segue to this new part of her life and uh, see what tangents we get on from there. So, uh, I Jen, welcome back. Thanks. Um, I think we could keep going for days on uh, the great work you've done with the domestic workers, but you, you're you not one to just rest on your laurels in any <laughs> respect. In fact, before the show, I said you're one of these people who only sleeps an hour a night. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about some of these new adventures you're on. Sure. Well, it actually is really connected to the domestic worker bills. We're still working in states around the country to try to establish some standards and protections for domestic workers. Um, we just had a victory in Oregon. The governor of Oregon just signed our legislation into law uh, two weeks ago. Great. So yes. I, I, was that right? It's four or five states? It's now five. Five states. A total of five, including New York. And, and one thing each, I think you'll find, of course, now is when you go to a new state, you'll be able to say this has been passed in five states. It gives you yes. uh, yes. a certain credit, you yes. know, so to speak. Yes, and what we're hoping is that although the political landscape in states is very challenging in this moment, as you know. Um, but there is a theory that's kind of like a dance party theory of change, where if you've ever been to a wedding, the first couple comes, the, the couple comes onto the dance floor and they have their first dance and they try to kick off the dance party and for some time it's a little bit awkward. Snowball. Yeah, right? and then you get, you know, the very close friends and family get on the dance floor and by the time you have four or five couples on the floor you have a little bit of a critical mass and then everyone feels safe to come on and join the party and I'm hoping that uh, with our state-based effort that we can get critical mass of states to do to move forward on this legislation and then create a ripple effect where um, suddenly it becomes the new normal and awesome. so now we've got our fifth state, and it's been very difficult to get uh, this far, but we are very optimistic about uh, the future and the kind of momentum that we've built through the, the five states moving forward. And, and, and I know we, we were supposed to be finished with the top, but I'm going to go a little further here. I'm guessing you do this on a very low budget, correct? It's true, a very low budget, and we really rely upon grassroots organizations that are affiliated with us at the local level in those states, really working their legislatures, working the media, working in the community, um, marching, doing press conferences, really, really pushing at the local and state level. All right, so take us through carrying uh, across generations. Right, so uh, in 2010, about three years after we formed our National Domestic Workers Alliance, so I started working in New York in 1998, organizing domestic workers. We founded this organization in, in uh, the New York Domestic Worker Group in 2000. And in 2007, what we realized was that there are groups like ours around the country that are doing this work, organizing domestic workers. And we need to come together because there's probably a tremendous amount that we could learn from each other, support each other. And we were all grappling with the challenges of trying to pass legislation, trying to organize, trying to really bring workers together and get to some scale of impact. And so we decided to have a meeting in Atlanta. About 50 domestic workers and advocates came together and we formed this national organization in 2007. And, um, and then three years after that, what happened was that we had grown and there were groups around the country who were starting to come together with us. And they were saying that their domestic workers in their localities are asking for training in elder care. 
because there was such a huge need on the part of their employers for more support when it comes to caring for people with dementia, caring for elders who need more support with groceries or with cleaning, activities of daily living is what they're called. Um, and the workforce, we didn't feel prepared. Housekeepers and nannies were hired to do very different tasks and they didn't feel prepared. And it was such a pattern that we decided to take a step back and understand what was going on and we realized that there's this tremendous demographic shift happening and we are graying as a nation. Some people call it the silver tsunami. Um, like we call it the elder boom because it's directly related to the boomers getting uh, reaching retirement age. And, and we need care and we need a strong caregiving workforce and that felt like an opportunity to bring together the needs of families and the needs of seniors, the growing older population in this country, with the needs of this workforce to develop a whole new approach to caregiving so that everyone could feel supported and have access to the choices and the dignity that they deserve. And that's when this new campaign called Caring Across Generation was born. That understanding that we need a strong workforce to support our elders to be able to live well as they age and that they should be able to live at home uh, in their communities connected to their families rather than be sent off to a nursing home which no one really wants. Now my lobbyist legislative wheels are spinning again here as you approach this mm -hmm. and you want to have perhaps legislative solutions is this an activity that states are going to want to license and regulate? Yeah, I think so. I mean, already um, many home care workers are working through state coordinated programs through the Medicaid program. And, um, and so I think that there are absolutely state um, budget and policy implications for this. But I also think that Americans are already paying a tremendous amount in incredibly inefficient ways for care that it isn't actually meeting their needs. The average nursing home um, stay, at, at the annual cost of a nursing home stay with a private room is $87,000 per year. And in New York, it's more like $150,000 per year. I mean, the number of American families that can actually afford to pay something like that is pretty slim, right. let alone the fact that 90% of Americans would prefer to stay at home. I was just going to say that. They would, would people rather be at home? Yeah, right? right. And it's a much more cost-effective choice to stay at home in place. And so states like Hawaii have started to develop solutions, so problem solving. Okay. And their solution is to create a state social insurance fund for long-term care where the residents of Hawaii would pay into it through their payroll um, deductions and when they needed it they could actually tap into this fund to cover up to a year of long-term care in the either at home or in an institution or in an assisted living facility the venue would be of their choice um, so that's one experiment um, Maine has another experiment in place. It's called the Keep Maine Home Initiative. And the Speaker of the House is championing it. Um, but it's basically a suite of policies that will make Maine more um, friendly or supportive of aging in place. So everything from increasing wages for caregivers mm -hmm. to changing transportation systems to support elders um, living in the community, things like that. So. Do you, are you building an organization? Uh, it's actually a, or, or expansion uh, of your existing organization. It's an expansion into a campaign. It's a movement that brings together 200 organizations from around the country, aging groups, disability rights organizations, uh, women's groups, uh, all kinds of organizations that see a stake in a new caregiving system in this country. Now, when you um, Talk about the elder care. Mm -hmm. You get issues like Alzheimer's and some. These are very difficult issues. Yes. When you have nanny, maybe it's not a good word to use, but when you have a nanny scenario, they may not be living in the home because they may take care of the children while the the parents are away for work. But right. the parents come home, and the parents then know arguably how to deal with their children and take care of the dinner and the dishes and everything. Right. 
with with the elder situation, mm -hmm. I, I would think a lot of that might tend to be living. That's right. Because you have to be there almost around the clock. Exactly. So is that a different? It's very different. Yeah. I mean, the the situation. There's similarities in that there, you're still working in somebody's private home, and it's a very difficult space to regulate, and there are very little standards and protections. Um, and most people don't really recognize that their home is someone's workplace, even though they hire somebody to work there. Um, and many employers don't think of themselves as employers. So there's a lot that's common across the board, but elder care is very different. It's a different set of skills, um, different knowledge base, different understanding uh, physically, right? Lifting and moving an, an yeah. adult yes. is a very yes. different task. As a result, occupational safety and health is a huge issue for home care workers and caregivers. Um, there's a way to lift and move somebody that's safe and ways that are not. Um, so these are all things that are incredibly different. It's a different skill set and knowledge base than caring for a child or cleaning a home. Um, most caregivers are also doing cleaning and cooking and many of the similar domestic work responsibilities. Um, and there are really good training programs out there. There's a model training program in Washington State um, that trains 40,000 home care workers per year that's really trying to elevate the standard of preparation for this workforce. Now, live-in is definitely more common for, live, for elder care. Um, most of the women that we work with work live-in 24-hour shifts, four days a week, um, and it's very strenuous and can be very uh, isolating. Um, and oftentimes the sleeping quarters are not adequate. Um, there are all kinds of issues around food and kitchen use and all kinds of things when it comes to live-in workers. Live-in workers are definitely more vulnerable because they are be hidden behind closed doors around the clock and expected to be on call and working around the so, clock. So did you see an expansion of the Bill of Rights concept here as well? Yes, Or absolutely. when you go into new states, we have a broader Bill of Rights concept than you've had in the past to encompass right. more people. That, and also we are looking to try to create new economic supports for families to be able to support the care that they need. So looking at everything from tax credits for families who are paying out of pocket for elder care to programs like what Hawaii is about to um, institute. Does Medicare pay for any of this? That is actually the, a great question because there's a lot of misunderstanding about Medicare. A lot of people think Medicare covers long-term care and it doesn't. Medicare covers very limited forms of home care that are about right, hospital, right after somebody's been discharged from the hospital after a procedure. But um, by no means does Medicare cover long-term care comprehensively. So essentially, the choices that families have are to either completely deplete all of their assets right. um, and impoverish themselves right. and go on Medicaid, Medicaid. or purchase long-term care insurance. And it is expensive to do long-term care insurance. Very few families can afford it. And oftentimes that insurance doesn't cover what you need when you need it. So it's also got a lot of limitations in terms of coverage. Although I might think that the insurance industry might be a natural ally of yours in this respect because if you can convince them that you have a product that works, they, they're much better off going your route than going the nursing home route because of the $87,000 a year deal. Right. So Absolutely. they could be a natural ally. And how, how about ARP? Do they get involved with you in this kind of AARP stuff? is a tremendous advocate for family caregivers, and, um, and we definitely work with them in states around the country to try to elevate the needs of seniors and caregivers. Um, and we have actually a really good partnership with the National Council on Aging. Um, really advocating for seniors at the service level, but also in terms of policy. Um, so it's a, what we're building is a multi-generational movement that is about bringing more care choices to families. And we see that as a multi-generational task and call to action. 
we're all going to be affected by the fact that right. we don't have a real care system in this country. And when you have an issue that touches so many people, I mean, a hundred million of us are directly affected by the need for care. Professional caregivers, family caregivers, older adults, and people living in multi-generational households are all directly affected. That's a powerful force for change, a hundred million people. And that is what my book and Caring Across Generations is trying to marshal. We're trying to awaken the caring majority in this country. Um, and we believe that ultimately we will win. Well, I know you're going to win. There's no doubt in my mind. <laughs> and hopefully it won't take seven years to get some of these victories. Yes. Um, now, a theme of your work is women. Yes. Women revolve around your world here. And one of the things I told you I want to talk about before we get to the end of the show is the role of women in politics and the role of women as leaders. And I know we don't have a ton of time here, but you're going to be speaking on that topic at the Aspen Institute. So yep. how, what's your sense of... Let's take the political system, first of all. There are people are bragging that we have more women in Congress and U.S. senators than ever, but by the same token, if you look at the percentage of the population, it's nowhere where it needs to be. So That's right. Why, why do you think women aren't jumping in to fill that void? Well, I think that the culture of politics is such that um, we haven't actually valued adequately the leadership contributions that a range of women bring. Um, we still have a model of leadership that is still um, very outdated and um, very male. Um, <laughs> no doubt about it. <laughs> um, and I think that because we haven't put the right family supports in place, that it is very difficult for women, not only in politics, but in any leadership context, to um, essentially what you're choosing between is family and work, which is an impossible choice. There's only so much time in a day, and oftentimes women, as the predominant family caregivers still in this country, are for forced to make the choice towards family over work um, because we haven't put the right family policy in place. Mm -hmm. um, we but are, I, I've worked with many women legislators back in Illinois who, after the children had grown, and left the home, and, and you talk about the second career thing, that's what they did. They jumped in with two feet to get in the political world. Now, some of them had already been on the school board and the county board, et cetera. But even that's few and far between. We have some very talented, very bright women who are now empty nesters. Why are they not jumping in? We need to support them to jump in. There's absolutely no reason why they shouldn't jump in. Um, it's very difficult, I think, to raise money, to uh, run for office in this climate, this economic money and politics climate, um, and I think that uh, we have to really get behind the women that we want to see lead. And see, I'd like to see that be one of your projects. <laughs> I mean, think about what you, 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 you take women in situations and then you see the mission there. Mm -hmm. I, I see this as a mission that someone it needs is, to take it on. It absolutely is. It absolutely is. And my mission really is to elevate low-income women in particular who I believe are canaries in the mind for all of us. I mean, the kind of economic struggles and realities that low-income women face in our economy and in our democracy are really bellwethers for what's to come for all of us if we don't actually turn things around in this country. And so for me, the voices of, I, I often talk about domestic workers as the ultimate futurists, because yeah. the conditions that they've been faced with for so long are actually coming to define more and more of the American workforce. Economic insecurity, lack of benefits, piecing together part-time work, informality of work. Um, and so I really do think that we need to support all women in politics and Low-income women and their experiences in particular really do need to shape how we think about public policy for the future so that we can really turn the tide on the kind of economic inequality that we've been dealing with for so long. Has anyone within these broad organizations you deal with that you're aware of um, run for office and win? Maybe it's state legislator or anything? Or no, they think about but it? we are certainly looking to run some domestic workers okay. for office Love around it. the country. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we're here at the Aspen Institute, and you're going to be a speaker. And tonight, your topic is going to be advice from women who lead. Yes. So what's your message tonight? What, you're a woman who leads. What's, what's your message going to be tonight when you speak? 
My message is going to be to love more, not less. And um, what I mean by that is the story I'm going to tell is a story about a woman named Lily who I met when I was 23 years old. She came to the United States as a nanny um, when she was 15 years old and she was promised a U.S. high school education and a salary that would be sent home to her family in Jamaica to help them economically. And um, after arriving in the U.S., the family cut off communication with her family, cut off really her contact with the outside world, didn't allow her to go, go to school, and never sent a uh, salary home to her family. And so she was essentially working in isolation, trafficked for 15 years, helped that family raise three children, and then at the age of 30 was finally able to escape, found our organization, and I helped her to find her, to seek justice, and to understand what her options were. And one thing she made clear to me from the beginning was that she didn't want to press criminal charges against her employers, despite the fact that they virtually enslaved her, they literally enslaved her, um, because she didn't want the children that she cared for to grow mm -hmm. up without their parents. And that kind of generosity of spirit is, the, is incredibly powerful. And in moments as a leader when I feel under siege or angry and my instinct is to um, either dehumanize the person who criticized me or um, my opposition, um, I think of Lily and I think about her choice, her choice to kind of get bigger. Uh, in her generosity and love more, not less. So that will be my message. Well, well I just met you today for the first time. There's no doubt that this is how you do le lead your life. And you've been an amazing success, and I wish all the best in all your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.